But it would get really chewy and hard, as you can tell. So bully, would they call each other? Because bully means you're tough, you're strong, like the meat that you that we ate, right? And the word today in schools and stuff, if you're being a bully, that's where that word comes from. You're a piece of tough meat, and you're you know, it's become derogatory. It used to be back in the day, like, hey, my bully boy. So I'm saying. Everybody, show me, bully boys, we're in. 
of sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue it is done, we'll take our leave and go. Her she'd not been two weeks from shore, when down on her a right whale bore. The captain called all hands and swore he'd take that belly in tow. Soon may the wellman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue it is done, we'll take our leave and go. Before the boat had hit the water, the whale's tail came up and caught her all hands to the side, harpooned and fought her when she dived down low. Soon may the wellman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue it is done, we'll take our leave and go. No line was cut, no whale was freed. The captain's mind was not hungry, but he belonged to the whaleman's creed. She took that ship in tow. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue it is done, we'll take our leave and go. For forty days and even more, the line went slack, then tight once more. All hands were lost, there were only four, but still that well did go. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue it is done, we'll take our leave and go. As far as I've heard, the fight's still on, the line's not cut, and the whale's not gone. The wellerman makes his regular call to encourage the captain, crew and all. Soon may the wellerman so long bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tugging is done, we'll take our leave and go. We'll take our leave and go. called uh, John Kanaka. Uh, this is a halyard shanty, um, and it's, you know, Hawaii was a major whaling port. Many Hawaiians worked aboard ships that sailed the Pacific, and they were renowned for their excellent seamanship. But English-speaking sailors often had difficulty pronouncing their names, however, so they called them by the Hawaiian name Kanaka, which means Hawaiian man. And also the lyrics, uh, Tulae, also come from Hawaiian language and a remnant of the shanty singing tradition for, of combining music and language of different seafaring cultures. So it was kind of a melting pot of different sounds and words that made up these sea shanties.
Morning. Anybody know this one? This one is uh, pretty famous as well. And it kind of is it's, it's satirical, this song. This song talks about how great it is to be a whaler. When it, you know, the money was one of those things where you didn't really like the work, but you liked the checks. Uh, which we've all had those jobs. And um, so anyway, this tells a story of what it's like to, you know, go to a whaling port and get on a ship. And, uh, you know, it's kind of for a laugh, this one. Oh, he wins a morning. Tis advertised in Boston, New York, and Buffalo. Five hundred brave Americans are willing for to go and to sing it.
one of the, some of the ropes on the, on the ship. And so how your chances were specifically, um, you know, rhythmic songs. So we're going to do this a cappella, just for the drum. And this one is originally Essequiba, Har uh, Essequiba River, which is in Guyana. And it's in South America. It kind of runs into the Amazon. It's a huge river. And this, again, highlights the fact that this, these are really cultures all around the world were participating and, they, and, we're, and we're getting, exchanging music, you know, on ships and uh, among the crew. So this one is kind of has like a, almost, you'll, you might recognize this almost sounds like, you know, uh, Harry Balaconte recently passed away. Uh, this kind of sounds to me like a, like a Calypso song. Yeah. So that kind of gives you, give you the feel of, uh, of what it might have been like to be with Hawaiians, be with guys from the West Indies, be with uh, Bonnikers, you know, all, all kinds of people. So. We just change it to Sagaponic Harbor. We change the lyrics a little bit, which is the sea shanty tradition, right? Sagaponic Harbor is the king of all the harbors. Sagaponic Harbor is the king of harbors. Repeat that thing. Sagaponic Harbor is the king of all the harbors. Sagaponic Harbor is the king of harbors. Somebody oh, somebody oh, but Italian now we are somebody oh. Somebody oh, somebody oh, but Italian now we are somebody oh. Sagaponic skippers are the king of all the skippers. Sagaponic skippers are the king of skippers all. Sagaponic skippers are the king of all the skippers. Sagaponic skippers are the king of skippers all. Somebody oh, somebody oh, holy time and now we are somebody oh. Somebody oh, somebody oh, holy time and now we are somebody oh. And now Sagaponic whiskey is the king of all the whiskey. Sagaponic Sagaponic whiskey is the king of all the whiskey. Sagaponic whiskey is the king of whiskey song. Somebody yo, somebody yo, holy time and now we are somebody yo. Somebody yo, somebody yo, holy time and now we are somebody yo. Sagaponic duties are the king of all the duties. Sagaponic duties are the queen of duties all. Sagaponic duties are the queen of all the duties. Sagaponic duties are the queen of duties all. Somebody oh, somebody oh, holy time and now we are somebody oh. Somebody oh, somebody oh, holy time and now we are somebody oh. Sagaponic whalers are the king of all the whalers. Sagaponic whalers are the king of whalers all. Sagaponic whalers are the king of all the whalers. Sagaponic whalers are the king of whalers all. Everybody, somebody oh, somebody oh. Night in late December, December, all of my money is spent, spent, spent. Where it went to, Lord, I can't remember. Remember, so down to the shipping office I went. Good idea. Back in the back, taking this, taking this last. Take a turn around the caps of Eva Hall. Eva Hall, about ship station was the end, the end. About for the rise around the horn. Well, that day there was a great demand.
this is a crowd favorite here. We'll do this one more song. This is uh, The Drunken Sailor. Everybody knows this one, right? What do you do with the drunken sailor? chased the giant creatures without remorse for millennia. Whales were hunted for many reasons, and humans have been systematically wiping them out from one ocean to the next. Today we have a much better understanding of environmental health, and we prioritize animal rights. But in the old days, humans mistakenly believed that the vast oceans and its resources were bottomless. The desire for wealth from whales pushed these creatures to the very verge of extinction. Why? primarily because of their blubber. The products made from whale blubber are unlike anything else of their time. They can be used for lighting lamps and machine lubrication and differ from any substance on Earth. Now, long before whaling ships from Sag Harbor crisscrossed the globe in search of whale oil, there is the story of shore whaling, or as, or as us bonnikers called it, to go off a whaling. From 1650 until 1917, when a whale was spotted from East Hampton Beach, there was a familiar call we used. It was if some lonely lookout on the dunes happened to spy a cluster of whale spouts, he or she would pass the word to the villagers by yelling, whale off, whale off. This phrase was repeated again and again until word spread like wildfire. So if you hear me today shout, whale off, please echo me, whale off. All right, ready, let's try it. Well off! Well off! Well off. Well off. Well off. Well off. All right, that's awesome. I think we're a fine crew gathered here today. But you can put away your harpoons for a minute because I got a few more things to say here. Now, the, sim the simplest definition of shore whaling is harvesting whales that either wash up on the beach or that are spotted from land. In these cases, whalers would launch small boats in an attempt to kill and tow the whale back to land. Bay, bones, baleen, meat, but mainly the oil from blubber was the goal of shore whaling. To a large extent, shore whaling really boosted East Hampton onto the world stage and created its first serious source of sustainable, lucrative income. I think it could be said that shore whaling helped early East Hampton not just survive, but truly thrive. But I'll get to that in a little bit. As you probably know, whales have been around for 50 million years. They evolved into our 90 different species that we have today. By the way, the largest creature to have ever existed was a whale. Does anyone know what type of whale? Blue whale. Blue whale. Blue whale. 
That's right. Whales are split into two major groups. Those with teeth who eat large prey, think sperm whales and orcas, and those with baleen who strain water through brush-like filters to slurp down tiny fish and krill, think right whales and humpbacks. Well off! Well off! Yeah. Roughly 10,000 years ago, after the last ice ages, as the planet slowly warmed and the oceans rose, Long Island was formed. Archaeological evidence of early native islanders here goes back at least 6,000 years. The Montauk and Shinnecock ancestors have been hunting whales for thousands of years off our beaches. Here's a rendering of a mica stone tablet from around the time uh, about 2,000 years ago and it was found by a farmer in Brookhaven in uh, 1865. It's about this big. The carving symbolizes a whale-like creature surrounded by other whales and fins. Um, it was probably used for ceremonial purposes. Now the first close-up encounter between whales was likely not at sea, but on a beach where a whale, either dead or dying, had washed ashore. No doubt this was astonishing and possibly frightening to the local inhabitants. But it probably didn't take long for those natives to figure out the bounty a beached whale contained food, lamp oil, bones, and teeth for all sorts of tools and building material. Native islanders would boil the blubber and mix the oil with their corn and beans. They would rub the oil into animal hives, uh, for preservation. Whale jerky could be eaten all year long. The rendered oil from an adult right whale could light a Montauk village for an entire year. A simple lamp was a clamshell filled with whale oil and a wick of twisted moss. Uh, and you'd have your light. The Montauks and Shinnecocks were part of the larger Algonquin nation, which runs from Delaware to Massachusetts. We still use many Algonquin words today. I'm against it, now pig. Sagaponic, chipmunk, opossum, raccoon, and canoe are a few examples. When it was native land, Eastern Long Island was at the heart of a watery domain, a vast trading network that connected Cape Cod, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Block Island, Fisher's Island, etc. This network was connected and linked by expert native watermen in massive dugout canoes. These unsinkable crafts were cut and burned out of giant tupelo trees. Tupelo wood is tough buoyant and doesn't soak up water. Now we're not talking about tiny thin skinned birch bark canoes, but 50 footers that could easily hold up to a ton of cargo and were crewed by as many as 40 men with stout wooden, uh, wooden paddles or also whalebone paddles. A few of these old whalebone paddles have actually been found in grave sites of Long Island Algonquins, meaning they were probably a favorite tool of the deceased. But a, the canoes themselves often had intricate carvings and were painted elaborate colors. These giant war canoes traversed Long Island Sound and other coastal waterways and rivers, mostly for trade. Think of these as the Amazon delivery trucks of their dead. <laughs> and this is one at the Shinnecock Museum. It's kind of a smaller version, but again, made from one giant piece of uh, tupelo, like a trunk. And here's yeah, like a ceremony. Speaking of trade, Montauk and Shinnecock wampum was an economic item that was highly coveted. It brought prosperity to the tribes here, keeping them at the center of the trade network. Bottom line, hunting whale in an open boat would have been all in a day's work for these hardy um, whalemen of yesterday. According to David Gardner, Lion Gardner's son, the Montauk Indians sacrificed the tails and fins to, fame, to gain favor of Manitou, uh, their most powerful god. In an elaborate ceremony, wrote Gardner, the tail and fins were roasted and eaten. The shaman then led a prolonged powwow and religious festival. There are frequent references to tails and fins of whales in Indian deeds and leases. The sachems reserved the rights to the tails and fins of whales that washed ashore for many years after the English arrived. The native tribes had a concern for balance in nature. This was expressed in their rituals honoring the spirits of animals taken by hunters. There was even a whale god named Moshop, a giant of a man who legends say barehandedly caught and killed the whales and then left them on the shore for the native people. Um, old Indian tales even claim the red stained cliffs of Montauk are from the blood of Moshup's whales. Hmm. Um, here's one of the earliest known descriptions of a Long Island whale hunt uh, told by an English explorer, George Weymouth, in 1650. They are masters of the winds and waves. Their manner of killing the whale, which they call Paudawi, is like this. The natives go out in the company of their king with a multitude of boats and strike him with a long spear with a bone made in the fashion of a harpoon. 
which they made strong with the woven bark of trees, which they let out after him. Then, then all their boats came about him, and as he shakes about the water with their arrows and spears, they shoot him to death. When they have killed him and dragged him to shore, they call all their chief sachems together and sing a song of joy. Also, in some cases, seal skins would be attached to the harpoon line to slow them down. This is not the best focus, but they would use that to slow the well down and kind of mark where the well was. Roger Williams in 1643 reported, wells were cut into several pieces and sent near and far. And he remarked about the Indians' ability in handling canoes beyond the surf. It is wonderful to see how they will venture in those canoes into any sea. Due to their long history of whaling and deep connection to the ocean, Native Americans were some of the best whalers, hands down. And that tradition would continue into the 16, 17, 1800s when Montauk and Shinnecock were highly valued as whalemen and harpooners. To this day, when there is a beached whale, a member of the Shinnecock Nation will visit the site to say prayers and blessings of the spirit to the, of the dead animal. This ritual is probably thousands of years old. Captain John Smith of Jamestown fame reported sighting large numbers of whales on a scouting exploration around Long Island in New England in 1615. He shared this information back home in England and it added to the growing fascination of settling the new world. Whales could be big business and help support and pay for the growing number of European colonies and that is exactly what happened here in East Hampton. Practically as soon as the first settlers arrived in East Hampton, in 1640, they began to harvest beach whales. The profits gained from harvesting the drift whales on the town beaches prompted early settlers to explore hunting whales offshore. It didn't take long for them to find out that the local Indians were experts at hunting whales in canoes, and soon the Montaukens and the Shinnecocks were giving lessons to the English in exchange for European trade goods like guns, metal tools, coats, and rum. Next, early East Hampton leaders began organizing groups of men called companies designed to pursue the highly coveted November to March. As opposed to the Puritan pilgrims of Massachusetts, Long Island was first settled by the Dutch West India Company to make a profit. Folks in Long Island quickly found that the whaling business would help build their tiny outpost at Manhattan, called New Amsterdam. They set up whaling stations on Long Island, and by far the most profitable came from eastern Long Island, sticking out like a giant thumb into the migrating pods of whales. The Dutch lost New York to the English twice, the second time in 1672. By then, whaling on eastern Long Island was a huge business and began to attract considerable notice. Royal governors for the next 100 years gave it close attention and demanded growing taxes on whale oil from the blossoming industry in Southampton and East Hampton. Almost immediately after East Hampton was established in 1648, whaling companies emerged. Settlers worked with local natives, and an agreement was made in 1667 with the Shinnecock that the town was to pay the natives five pounds of wampum for each whale captured. Colonial whalers relied heavily on the talent and strength of Indians who were hired seasonally as contract workers. Fishing and farming uh, was a living on East Hampton, but whale oil meant prosperity and a ready export for trade to Europe. This is one of the first illustrations of a whale hunt on Easter Long Island. Money was scarce, taxes were paid in wheat, wampum, cattle, whale oil, and Indian corn. The robust purchasing power of whale oil is demonstrated in 1701 when Daniel Miller, with his sons and enslaved Africans, took one whale and sold enough oil to buy, one, to buy a large farm in Springs. Ever wonder why East Hampton had so many windmills than most of colonial Long Island, or maybe the whole East Coast, they were expensive and intricate to build. But because of that extra income from whaling, our founding fathers found a clever way of reinvesting in themselves with whale money, growing large fields of corn and grains and building windmills to mill them. Best of all, whaling and farming complemented each other perfectly because they each took place in opposite seasons, farming in the summer and whaling in the winter. In our day and age, it's hard to grasp the importance of whale oil back before electricity, but it was by far the most superior source of light. It burned slowly, it was very bright, and gave off little smoke. Tallow candles made from animal fat in early colonial times were only for the very wealthy. Pitch pine slivers were also burned but gave off little light and lots of smoke. If the town was lucky enough to find a sperm whale, the waxy spermaceti from the cavity of the head made a superior candle. When mixed, with whale, with, when mixed with oil from Bayberry, the candles not only glowed but filled the home with a perfume scent. 
The bones of the well could be used to make buttons, corset stays, handles, also it was ground up for fertilizer. Well bone shavings were used in stuffing the best upholstered furniture as it was very springy. Well meat supposedly if cooked and eaten right away was tender and tasted like beef steak. Mince pies with well meat was an amagansett specialty. Mm. Well oil was also in high demand for lubricating fine gears and watches, clocks, and other tools. These tools in this, in this barn probably were some of them lubricated with whale oil. Also, the famous Domini clocks were greased with it. Whale oil was also used to make soap and even margarine. Yum. <laughs> well off. Well off. <laughs> Samuel Maverick wrote in 1649, on the east end of Long Island, 13 whales were taken before the end of March, and here they are seen daily in Gardner's Bay. The other week, a small boat struck two whales but lost both. The iron broke in one, the other broke the line. Daniel Denton wrote in 1670, Upon the south shore of Long Island in winter lie stores of whales, which the inhabitants have begun with small boats to make a trade catching to their no small benefit. From 1650 to 1680, the amount of whales taken each year slowly grew as the colonial whalers became no more knowledgeable and hired Indians to help. By 1680, Amagansett was the most profitable ocean town for whaling on the entire East Coast. Not New Bedford, not Nantucket, not Sag Harbor, but little old Amagansett, right here 12 generations ago. In 1687, there were 12 companies engaged in whaling on the South Fork. By then, East Hampton trustees were up and running, and they tried to help govern the disputed whaling beaches. Even to this day, East Hampton trustees still have their hands full with beach access rights. <laughs> So intense was the competition for whales that a boundary had to be set up between East Hampton and its neighbor, Southampton. Drift whales and day-long whaling expe expe uh, expeditions were now big business, and the profit from those whales fueled not only lambs, but the economy of whale towns. Adult right whales were a lucrative quarry, producing from 30 to 50 barrels of oil. The profits from one right whale could buy a medium-sized farm in East Hampton. The right whales got its name, because it was the right whale to hunt. Clever, right? Mm -hmm. So here's why it was the best whale. Generally, generally docile and relatively slow moving, right whales could easily be approached by men in boats. Right whales rarely dive for long periods and tend to surface close to where they last submerged. On being killed rather than sink as many other whales, the right whale usually floated, giving its attackers the ability to secure ropes and tow it back to shore for processing. Best of all, the right whale produced copious amounts of oil, baleen, and meat, all items in high demand. The right whales can grow to a length of 60 feet and weigh up to 100 tons. Its enormous mouth, which takes up a quarter of its body, is an incredible mechanism for obtaining food. Hanging down from its top jaw are hundreds of strips of baleen up to 100 feet, uh, 10 feet long. Swimming with its mouth wide open, the right whale takes in huge drafts of water filled with small fish and krill. Having corralled its meal, it closes its mouth and thrusts up its massive tongue against the baleen, capturing its lunch while straining out the seawater. With a swallow, the feeding loop continues until the whale's mighty hunger is satisfied, may consume two to three tons of fish in one meal. Baleen is made of keratin similar to the texture uh, in your fingernail, same, same material. That was in high demand for corset stays, buggy whips, hairbrushes, umbrellas, and other products requiring strength and flexibility. Before there was plastic, there was baleen. And there might even be some baleen incorporated in some of these tools here. Remember, shore whaling was done primarily in the cold winter months due to the right whale's migrations. Every October, the Arctic freeze reduces the whale's food supply of krill, so they swim south following the Atlantic coast to spawn in the warmer waters off the Carolinas, um, where they remain until February when they return north to their feeding grounds in the Arctic. Well off! Well off! <laughs> I said they are gentle, but only if they're left alone. If once harpooned, however, they become extremely dangerous adversaries with surprising speed and tremendous force and agility. The mammal can swing its powerful tail in a huge arc and smash a boat to kindling, killing and drowning its crew almost instantly in some cases. Can you imagine for a moment leaving solid, safe land in the middle of winter and rowing miles out in a tiny boat in the waves and deep, dark water chasing this giant a shadow in the depths? into his own watery realm, what nerve and devotion to their family and community it must have taken to paddle out. Just imagine what these early men felt being sometimes 15 miles offshore in the middle of a freezing winter night, 
wind and snow blowing against them as their tiny boat is pulled farther into the darkness by an angry bohemian. Ocean temps in the winter are in the 40s, so men were constantly surrounded by almost sudden death if they went in, and that certainly happened. No wetsuits back then. These were brave and hardy men, to say the least. Men who were encouraged by their fathers, uncles, and brothers who sat beside them. This would have been uh, another great time to see sea, the same sea shanties as they were rowing out, uh, to keep the rhythm of their oars, keep their spirits up. By the way, I use the term men because in all my research, I haven't come across a single woman to go off the whaling in East Hampton. There was a famous woman whaler from Up Island, Smith Point, Madam Martha Turnstall Smith, who when her husband was killed by a whale, took over his company as captain with her Shinnecock crews and averaged 10 whales a winter for the next wow. decade. That was one tough woman. <laughs> now, the women of East Hampton were strong-willed and independent, and records show that they were an intricate part of the whale processing, working tirelessly beside the men. Often, women would also watch for whales at the lookout stations or patrol the beaches on foot or on horseback. Abigail Baker was on patrol one day in 1707, riding her horse all along the beach from East Hampton to Bridgehampton and sighted 13 whales. She must have made a tidy profit because the first to give the whale alarm was always rewarded with some share of the spoils. Mm. But typically, it was the men who actually paddled out and matched their wits and puny strength against their enormous adversary. Mm. The joy of winning a battle with the sea seems to have outweighed its ever-present risks and danger. Like big wave surfers or mountain climbers, some whalemen might have been thrill seekers to some degree as young men tend to be. Early church, early church death records have endless entries like drowned, lost at sea, crushed by a whale, or went for a whale and never came back. Mm -hmm. February 24, 1719, Minister Nathaniel Hunting from the Presbyterian Church uh, sadly recorded, this day a whale boat being alone struck a whale and she coming under the boat staved it in and the men were not hurt with the whale yet before any help came to them, four men were tired and chilled and fell off the boat and the oars to which they hung and were drowned. Henry Parsons, William Schellinger, Lewis Mulford, and Jeremiah Conklin, Jr. all perished this day from a whale. Mm -hmm. Another tragic inscription in an old <laughs> Mulford family account book is this entry. The night before Daniel Baker was drowned out whaling, his wife dreamed the tide rose so high that it came up to the house, burst open a door, and brought in a coffin. She requested him not to go off a whaling that day. She said she was afraid some accident would happen. He replied, I think I will still go out today, but I won't go out anymore. <laughs> Daniel should have listened to his wife because he did indeed drown that day after a whale crushed his boat. Mm -hmm. Every man, woman, and child in East Hampton was connected to whaling. Debts were paid in whale oil and whale bone. The ministers and schoolmasters, salaries were partially paid by whale byproducts. Schools let out when a whale was spotted because every able-bodied bonnaker in town had to do his or her share to process the whale. The men of the Montauk and Shinnecock tribes were still hands down the best whalemen and were high demand to join the English colonists on their whale hunts. African Americans, both free and enslaved, were another important part of early whaling, but are seldom mentioned in our town's whaling history. Whale boat captains recruited natives on the hunt, even setting up contracts with them. The first whaling contracts were entered in the Southampton Town Records in 1670. Two entrepreneurs, Josiah Langdon and John Howell, recruited native whalers for the season by offering them coats, shoes, stockings, powder, shot, and corn. The following season, four more contracts were negotiated on nearly similar terms. The system went on for decades. The native whalers signed on for a season and then began to purchase goods on their credit line from the captain. By the time the season was over, they were in debt for more than they had earned that year, keeping the Indian whalers in a form of continued servitude to pay off their debts. This system gave the owners complete control of the transactions. Beaches were divided into sections from Montauk Point to Southampton. Groups of families or companies were assigned to the beaches close to them, and they took turns watching for whales. Examples, you know, the Wainscott Dumplings, East Hampton Village, Amagansett all had their own companies. Usually from the highest dune, or in some cases high platforms were built, where the watcher would have a better view of the surrounding ocean. Back then, most locals worth their salt would have known the type of whale over a mile away by simply observing its spout. Each whale species has a distinctive spout. Northern Atlantic right whales have a double blowhole. Uh, humpback whales have a single blowhole and a balloon-shaped spout. 
nearly as wide as high, and sperm whales have a uniquely angled spout from a blowhole on the left <coughs> side of its head. When a whale was spotted, the watcher would yell, whale off! Whale off! Whale off! <laughs> and they would hoist a flag, and this set in motion an exciting chain of reaction. Soon, horns would be sounded, and whale off would be heard as the town folks hurried to their appointed tasks. Next, boats and equipment would be carted down to the beach or by ho horses or oxen. Ideally, there would be two or three boats that set off after a whale. A typical whale boat was 28 feet long by 6 feet across. In fact, the Coast Guard rescue surf boats were modeled after its early predecessor, the whale boat. And this boat, with overlapping cedar planking design, called the clinker method, differed little from the strong and pliable vessels used by those ingenious Vikings over a thousand years ago. Both were tough yet flexible, sharp at bow and stern to cut through the steep surf. Most whaling boats were also carried a short collapsible mast and sailed to use if the wind were favorable. I read a few accounts when a whale boat would be sailing alongside a swimming whale matching speed before harpooning it. Since whaling season was during the winter, the men were dressed warmly. Heavy woolens underneath, heavy hand-knit wool socks, a thick flannel shirt, old suit of clothes, hip boots, heavy peacoat jacket, and a cap with ear flaps. Wool mittens were an important item as wool stays warm when wet. The men typically also grew long beards and long hair. Once in the water, the captain in the stern steered the boat using a long steering oar. The four men in the middle each had their own 15-foot oar. Harpoonist in the bow also had an oar, though shorter. Under the commands of the captain, they would chase the whale as fast as they could. When a whale would die, an experienced captain could still follow the giant mammal's movements below, from rising bubbles and a slight oily residue that appeared on the surface above the swimming whale. The oarlocks were covered in leather and generously greased to reduce creaking and alerting the quarry. Whales have extremely good hearing in some of the widest hearing ranges of any mammal. Who knew? <laughs> All went well, and the small boat could get as close to the whale as possible. And before the whale realized what was happening, the first mate in the bow threw or jabbed a harpoon into the whale towards the head or the back. Ideally, the barb of the harpoon catches into the thick blubber, and the whale and the whale boat are connected. The harpoon is 11 feet long and <coughs> made from the best hand wrought iron, tempered just right so that it can get twisted and bent but never break. Not all blacksmiths knew how to do that. The head or dart went through many evolutions over the centuries. And here's a, slide. here's a slide. So these are the early harpoons. And then they later on had a toggle, a hinge. So once it went inside, it would open up so it would have a better grasp inside. And then this is, the, um, um, this is what they would use to kill the whale at the end. Um, if possible, another boat would get a harpoon into the whale so they would be even more secured. As soon as they were fastened, the captain yelled back oars, and the boat would ease back off. Because as you can imagine, the whale became furious and would roll and thrash around. This was the most dangerous time when the men in the boats could easily be crushed. The rope, over a thousand feet long, coiled in a wooden tub, played out as the whale struggled to break free. The heart, heat of the friction from the running rope on the wood could create a fire if not doused with seawater continuously. After this initial spasm of anger and frustration, the whale might take off into deeper water, pulling the whale and the men along uh, to speeds up to 25 miles an hour. This was the famous Nantucket sleigh ride. Once in deeper waters, the whale could also dive, and the men would have a knife or a hatchet ready to cut the line at the very last moment before the entire boat and crew were pulled down into the murky depths of the freezing ocean. After what could be a few minutes or many hours, and the whale tired itself out enough to stop moving, the whale boat crept up slowly and quietly. This time, the honor went to the captain to make the final kill. This was done with a 15-foot lance with an extremely long, sharp blade. The captain would stab inside the whale to puncture its heart or lungs. He would do this as many times as possible until the dying whale spouted blood, known as fire in the chimney. In some cases, the captain would climb onto the whale's back and serve the coup de grace from atop the massive victim. Ideally, the whale floated and was towed back to the beach by its tail. Another way a whale, harvest whale made it to the beach was if the wind was from the southwest, and as you know, our predominant wind in seven is from the southwest. So it's a perfect wind to blow the floating prize back to the nearest beach. Sometimes this would take a few days. Usually, whales were left to drift ashore if there were more whales killed than whale boats. Or in some cases, weather became dangerous. Uh, a blizzard or a nor'easter caused a few boats to race home, some never making it back to safety. 
If a whale was sent to drift ashore, the harpoon was left stuck in the whale, which had the initials or symbol of the owner, like a reserve sign that everyone respected. Although, I read in some incidents where East Hampton whales drifted west of Bridgehampton and Southampton, one, on more than one occasion, rival whale crews fought it out over the massive carcass. Let's just say many harpoons were not returned. <laughs> this began a rivalry between East Hampton and Southampton, which still exists today. Go Bonnick. <laughs> Oftentimes, when a whale was spied, uh, be towed to shore, other small boats might paddle out from the beach to bring water and food to the tired, hungry whale. In some cases, the exhausted and battered men traded places with new, fresh hands. These were often teenagers who were strong enough to tow in a dead whale, but not old enough to join the hunt. As remembered by Everett Edwards in 1891, we watched from this high sand dunes as Father and Uncle Jess's boat started to tow the big whale in. Then came a 12-hour pull. They could only row about a mile an hour. They were still about six miles off the land at 4 o'clock when Dan Loper and myself and three other boys rowed out with water and food for all hands. The men had left home early in the morning with nothing to eat or drink and were glad to see us. When we boys got out there and found Ben was hurt and unable to row, I took his place and he came ashore in the dory which was quickly rowed back to the beach. The final stage of the towing had to be coordinated with the tide because the carcass needed to be come to rest as high up on the beach as possible. The men towed the whale boat in, fe in tail first and anchored it against the pull of the falling tide. Once exposed on the tidal flats, the crew began the processing of butchering. Raise your hand if you ever flayed a fish. Everybody? It takes some skill and gets pretty messy, right? Well, now imagine flaying a 150,000 pound whale with up to 50 men helping in the processing in the middle of winter. It could take three days to fleece one whale. First, they severed the head with axes and boat spades. The boat spade resembles a shovel with a flat razor sharp blade. And he's got one right there. The workers removed the baleen from the mouth and then turned to the messy business of removing the blubber. Using the boat spade, the men cut the blubber into strips called flensing. The two thick foot blubber and six foot long blubber slabs would be hooked and peeled off by men pulling together on winches and pulleys. This would have been another great time to sing a sea shanty. They would load these long, thick marble colored slabs onto horse or ox carts that would be wheeled to the local triworks. There the huge hunks would be chopped up into smaller, more manageable chunks and boiled or tried into huge 250 gallon kettles on a stone furnace. As the oil melted out, the blubber, it was skimmed off and poured into cooling vats. The men scooped the scraps of whale skin out and used them to fuel the fire. This, this stuff was called crackling and was supposedly pretty tasty. It was said that a whale could cook itself with its own skin. I think it's kind of like when you're cooking bacon and then at the end you have all that oil left over. Um, when the oil cooled enough, it was poured into wind barrels for shipment to Boston, New York, or London, etc. As you can imagine, it was a dirty, smelly business. The odor was so pungent that trying stations were always located some distance from the nearest village or homestead. Boat crews worked in shifts around the clock for as long as a week. The main try works in Amagansett, which was used for decades, was just around the corner um, where the Marine Museum is today. That's where it was, basically, right there. Um, and these are actually pictures from the Amagansett Try works that they had set up there. This is the kind of an illustration dragging these giant slabs of the whale blubber. Um, and this is the old try works in Amagansett. It's kind of a fuzzy photo you can see. There was a big hole in the top to let the smoke out, but it was enough to keep them out of the wet, you know, the winter weather. All right, so it was an unwritten law in East Hampton that no alcohol was allowed on the whale hunts. Every man needed to be at his sharpest and quick-witted, all sense of full capacity to have a chance to whale. But once back on dry land, with a whale, it seems that a festive air was invoked. Families would gather, big bonfires were lit, fish and meat were dipped into the boiling vats of oil to cook, a crispy fried delicacy. And you guessed it, the jug was passed around as the whale man no doubt retold of the day's triumph. A large well could produce 50 barrels of oil, each barrel holding roughly 32 gallons. That's a total of 1,500 gallons per whale. At the end of the whaling season, after the whale oil and baleen had been carted off to the warehouses of Northwest Harbor to await shipment to New York, Boston, Boston 
London, etc., the owners at that point would calculate how much each whaler earned. Their first share went to the whale owners, the second half went was divided among the whaling crew. Although each year could differ greatly, if a whaling company had a good year to 10 whales, each whaleman would have more than enough money to live off of and then some. So again, it was serious dough if anyone was willing to take the risks. Families like Bennett's, Lopers, Millers, Lester's, Osborne's, Edwards, Talmadge's, Conklings, Baker's, Barnes, Schellinger's, all were fishermen and whalers. Well uh, any relatives of anyone? Whalers, relatives, <laughs> family, someone's family? Cool. It could be argued that the American Revolution had its first roots in whaling, when the English governor demanded an exorbitant tax for every whale taken. Early bonkers got pissed off. <laughs> Samuel Fish Hooks Mulford in 1711 became enraged when his two sons were arrested by the governor of New York for failing to pay taxes on their whale oil and baleen. The plucky white haired skipper had enough of the old unfair taxes that were ruining the budding whaling industry. Mulford lived in East Hampton but was a legislator in the government of the colony of New York. He was also a whale oil merchant. He had busy warehouses along Northwest Harbor, East Hampton's main port at the time. The British governor of New York required every whaling company to buy a license from him and claim one quarter of all their whale oil and bone. In addition, the tax whale oil had to be brought to the Royal Port of New York. To get around this, many bonnikers sold their oil to Boston and Connecticut to avoid the tax. The governor accused several whalers, including Mulford, of cheating him and hauled them into court. Mulford then, in his early 70s, had appeared in court over 15 times, a variety of fines, and his son's arrest was the final straw. He decided to take the complaints directly to the King of England himself and sail to London. When he reached London, he found himself in a proud, sophisticated city uh, where the government doors were closed to an East Hampton whaler dressed in homeless spun clothes. <laughs> Worse yet, the skipper had his pockets picked several times on the street. Striking back with Yankee ingenuity, Mulford sewed fish hooks into his pockets. <laughs> so when the next pickpocket tried to steal the whaler's money, his hand was caught fast on the fish hooks, and Mulford held on to him with an iron grip until he could be turned over to the authorities. The incident immediately became London gossip and was reported in all the newspapers. The old Bonnaker whaler became an overnight star. Now, instead of being shunned, the skipper became a celebrity of sorts and was allowed to plead his case. He met with King George and addressed the House of Commons when he said, the custom of whale fishing is free. It is an ancient custom, more ancient than the colony of New York, and not in any man's memory to the contrary, till of lately. The taxes were revoked, and Captain Fish Hooks Mulford returned to East Hampton a hero. He lived at the historic Mulford farmhouse, which has been preserved as a museum, as we all know. Well off! Well off! <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, a tinder for the American Revolution had its early roots in Long Island coastal whaling, when whale oil was one of the first commodities to be unfairly taxed. So I have to give a quick shout out to the famous Patriot whaleboat raid on British occupied Sag Harbor in 1777, called the Battle of Sag Harbor. This extraordinary mission could easily be its <coughs> own talk, but here it is in a nutshell. Patriot Colonel Miggs, under the direction of George Washington, set out from New Haven, Connecticut with 130 men and 15 whaleboats. Most of these men and boats were from East Hampton, tough bonnikers who knew how to handle a whaleboat on rough seas. On the night, May 27th, under the cover of darkness, the 15 whaleboats rowed across the choppy Long Island Sound, landed in Orient, dragged the boats across land of Conic Bay, and about midnight reached Sag Harbor. Patriots quickly and quietly marched to the small British fort near where the old whalers' church is today. The Yankees attacked, and there was a brisk fight where a handful of British soldiers were killed and 50 captured. The American Patriots then burned a dozen British ships in the harbor. A few high-ranking officers were also captured at the building, which is today the American Hotel. Not an American was killed or wounded, and the Patriots and their prisoners safely returned to Connecticut the next day. All in all, it was one of the only continental victories on Long Island during the American Revolution, and was done so on the broad, strong backs of East Hampton Wellmen and their small but tough, versatile vessels. You're welcome, Sag Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> Around 1780, and this is the site of the old well, the old British fort right here where the cemetery is now. Um, after 1780, the focus of whaling on eastern Long Island shifted from our beaches to Sag Harbor with its new Long Wharf and Deep Harbor. Also, the northern right whale population had decreased dramatically. 
Many young East Hampton shore whalers joined Sag Harbor Whaling Crews as coveted, experienced whalemen. Among the most sought after on these long voyages were, you guessed it, the Shinnecock and the Montaukets. One of the last and most famous Amagansett whalers was Captain Joshua Edwards, right here, known as Captain Josh. He lived from 1830 until 1950 and was a legendary whaler. The Edwards were one of those first families in East Hampton that lived off what they could grow or catch. A large handful of that big family became successful whalemen. And I believe David Rattray is like the great grandson of hmm. Captain Josh. Another reason Captain Josh was so respected, he had traveled every corner of the globe in a number of whaling hunts. So when he came back, running the Amagansett Shore Whaling Company was second nature, and Captain Josh became a legend to his people and still is to this day. Anyone here related to Captain Josh? Yeah? So here's, one, here's one of the last stories before I wrap up. Um, New York City's Museum of Natural History and East Hampton Whaling Pass are firmly linked. It was February 1907 when Dr. H.C. Bumpers, director of the museum, had read about a whale that had been killed on East End by Captain Josh Edwards. The 78-year-old whaler was at the end of his whaling career, but not at the end of his fame. Here he is sharpening a spade, right? Dr. Bumpers wanted to acquire from Captain Josh the whale skeleton for exhibition at the museum. By the time, by the, time the museum representative arrived at Amagansett, the blubber had been removed in the carcass all 54 feet of it sat slowly sinking into the sand. This is an actual photo from that day. The whale was the largest right whale ever recorded at the time. The skeleton would be of great importance, but how could they get it back to New York with the temperature at 20 degrees and a tough wind tearing across the beach? The carcass, even with the blubber removed, still weighed almost 50 tons. The museum hired local bonnikers to hack carefully at the remaining carcass, removing the bones. Then, without warning, a storm came out of the west the waves crashed into the carcass. The workmen furiously anchored the beast to the beach, hoping that it would be not, not be washed away. The storm lasted three long days, and when it was over, the whale was gone. The anchoring ropes were there, but no whale. The ropes were still taut. The whale was now buried beneath the sand. Oh my the temperature that day was only 12 degrees as the work crew labored to remove the remaining bones out of the freezing water and sand. And they did it, retrieving every last bone. For many years, the skeleton of Captain Josh's whale hung at the Museum of American Natural History in New York City to educate and enthrall visitors. Believe it or not, just recently there has been talk about bringing this skeleton back to Amagansett for display. Wow. That'd be pretty cool. Right now it's like in the basement of the museum. Like so many wild creatures, fate, whales became less common off our beaches with overhunting. Before whaling, it is estimated that there were around 20,000 Atlantic right whales. Today, they hover around 400 whales. Wow. Humans continue to be their worst enemy, but there is hope now that they are protected and their population is slowly gaining ground. Growing up here, I don't ever remember seeing whales off our beach, but during the past few summers, we've begun to see them again. Anyone seen a whale last summer? <laughs> I'm glad my kids will grow up in an East Hampton that got its whales back. <laughs> if we want whales to survive today, we have to apply our knowledge of whaling history to our future decisions affecting our waters. Every time we champion cleaner and quieter waters, we are saying thank you, and more importantly, welcome back. Yes. That's it, guys. Thanks so much. Yes. Thank you so much. I would like to add two things. You know, the reason those Sabonica whalers were so aggressive in that Sag Harbor battle was that we were occupied for seven years by the British troops. That tended to inspire people to do what they could, to fight back when they could. Now, sometimes we couldn't, but there were incidents like that where what people years? were fighting back. We were, we, were, we were held hostage. The village and the town was held hostage by British troops, which means they took the oh, cattle, wow. They took the food, they took the little girls, whatever they wanted, they took. And you know, they, and they, all the locals, including Mulford, had to sign a pledge of, I love the king. And then Mulford signed the pledge and then left for, for uh, Connecticut and died in Connecticut, leaving his wife and seven children and four slaves wow. on the Mulford farm. You can imagine how difficult it, was be, it would be to be occupied today think of Ukraine, okay? Mm -hmm. Secondly, if you ever want to read an amazing book about whaling, The Essex. 
the part of the sea. Mm -hmm. right. the, the, mo the movie Moby Dick and all the stories about Moby Dick were written about the Essex. Mm -hmm. And it was not a life that many of us would take, but it's a life that inspired a lot of people all over the world, really, to see the rest of the world and to go whaling. So, David. Thank you. The wind turbines that they're putting in the out yeah. of the ocean, that's pretty bad. I, I, think. I don't want to get that. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yes. I mean, the speed of the whale was what? I mean, it seems logical, seriously, David, that someone would see a whale on the beach, pull a whale off, run into town, get 20 people in a boat, and somehow catch the whale. It just doesn't seem possible. Well, how, I they mean, would be, how, how did that happen? You know, if, like, we've, we see them now in the, yeah. in the summer, and you can see that they will be following a pod, or following a school, a maiden, right? And they're kind of be doing a big loops out there. You're right, sometimes they're just saying there. Yeah, they, they, they would stay there. The west, yeah. but they, they would kind of move their way, slowly grazing as they would go oh. in, a, in a direction. So, yeah. They, they so, would, I mean, it wasn't moving. just one whale they just saw. It would, it would usually be a pod of whales, yeah. Okay. It would be okay. a big pod. Yeah. Yes? Are there any more right whales alive? There, there's about 400 left. Oh, but of that whale. Yeah, they don't really come near up the shore anymore. They learned the lesson, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a question about the whales that we're seeing now, like this yeah. summer and last summer. And you know, it's funny because a lot of people who didn't really know anything were just speculating that maybe that wasn't a good thing for the whales. Maybe it was because of global warming and things like that. But I mean, it's good to hear you say that it's positive. You can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, no, it's definitely showing that our waters are cleaner. And you know, like New York Harbor, you know, was a, was a mess for 100 years or so. Now there's whales in New York Harbor. They've, they've done a really good job of cleaning up the Hudson River. They, so I think in general our waters are cleaner. We can see the huge uh, schools of Manhattan um, that, that are back now because those were overfished. Mm -hmm. So that's a really big food so source for the humpbacks and the finbacks, which are, that's what we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, a good, it's a good thing. I think some of the migration patterns have shifted a little bit because of the glo global warming, but I think it's a good thing in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, All right guys. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Right, 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 Yeah.